All right. How are you all doing today? Good stuff so far, hasn't it been? I always look forward to this conference. This is my third time, and I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Doug and Bill slash Phil, whatever. Thank you so much, guys, for your, your work, your effort, and the rest of the team uh, that has put this great conference together. Also look forward to B-Sides Augusta tomorrow. How about anybody else going to B-Sides Augusta? All right. Good, good. Um, as, uh, as Doug, or excuse me, I really didn't mean to do that. As Phil mentioned, my name is Josh Brower. <laughs> I'm just going to stop. As Phil mentioned, my name is Josh Brower. I've worked the last 10 years in the international nonprofit community, helping to protect the lives and work of people around the world. Uh, this morning, I'm here to talk to you about uncovering persistence with auto runs and security onion. Persistence is typically one of the primary goals that threat actors that are targeting your network are trying to attain. Whether they are opportunistic threat actors or whether it is a long-standing campaign against you and your organization, the ability to remain active across reboots, possibly even across imaging, is really key for them. For us as defenders, obviously, it should be very obvious that that is one of our keys, is being able to uncover with where their persistence lies, and specifically in the Windows area is where we're going to be looking at. Last year, I spent a bit of time integrating another Sys internals tool, Sysmon, and the data that that provides into Security Onion. Uh, thanks to James Taylor, we now have full coverage across all of these Sysmon event IDs in ELSA, and we're getting there with OSEC. If you have not looked at Sysmon, I highly encourage you to do it. It provides a rich data set, both from a detection and an incident response perspective. So earlier this year, I started looking at what are the tools are available that provide some rich data that I can continue integrating into um, the environments that I monitor, both from a detection and an IR perspective. And that's where auto runs come in. You may be familiar with auto runs, especially from the GUI side on the right hand side. You can grab it at live.sysinternals.com. It is another sysinternals tool and it exists. You download it and run it against the Windows system. It exists to bring to light all the different areas of persistence that it knows about on a Windows system. Some of the areas that you can see are boot execute, app init DLLs, explorer add-ons, sidebar gadgets, image hijacks, and the list goes on and on. Lots of different areas that it brings to light. It also has a number of other pretty neat features. It can verify code signatures um, so that we can go ahead and anytime we see a file, we can verify that it's a legitimately signed Microsoft file filter that out, and then focus on the other data at hand. It also allows you to check virus total, so you can upload hashes and check it against virus total and see if you get any matches. For our purposes, we're going to be using the auto runs command line version, and we're going to be trying to integrate that data into Security Onion. Kind of a taste of what that data looks like, we're going to look at the hijacks category from auto runs, and the hijacks category simply shows all the different image hijacks at the time of log generation. So just to kind of get you an idea of what this may look like, uh, this is a couple of screen caps from one of uh, the production networks that I monitor within a day of getting this on the network. This is ELSA. You can see that we uh, have a class of auto runs, category of hijacks, or grouping by entry. We have some interesting looking stuff here. Okay, search settings.exe, umbrella, and the web steroids.exe. If we look at the same data just from a different perspective, group by path now, we can see task lists and iExplore.exe. These are the images that are being hijacked, and image hijacking is simply in the simplest form. Let's edit the registry and every time an image is run, either run another app alongside of it or replace that. There are legitimate uses for it. If you're running a debugger, you want to be able to run that debugger against the image, and so there are legitimate uses. <coughs> But anytime you see the hijacks category come up in your data from auto runs, you definitely want to check in and see what's going on. In this case, this was simply adware that was left over from a system. I actually had uh, logs from Security Onion that verified. So again, from my perspective, this is a win-win because I'm able to now bring the contextual data of host data as well as the network data and it brings a complete picture. And that's been my goals in the last couple of years is I've got great coverage from a network perspective, but I want to keep bringing that host data. And that's where Sysmon 
comes into play, and then auto runs. In some locations uh, that I work with, Sysmon is not the ideal tool to use. You have to install it on the system. I can't run it on a system. Auto runs, I can just run it at once against the system, grab the data, and then baseline it and come back to it at a later date. Is that making sense so far? Great. All the interactivity, so you can throw tomatoes, things like that, whatever you want to do. Or Chick-fil-A sandwiches. If there's any left, throw them on up here. All right, so two goals for our time this morning, implementation and real world use. I want us to, when you go back to your work next week, if you found this interesting, I want you to be able to go back and easily integrate this into your network. So we're gonna briefly look at implementation, how do you get this going on your network? Secondly is real world use. We've had this going in a couple different environments for a few months, and so the last little bit we're gonna talk about is some examples of the data that we've seen, how to slice and dice it, how to look at it in a way so that when you start getting that data in ELSA and whatever other tools you're using, you know how to look at that data. So our two goals. So first of all, implementation. I kind of tend to go toward the Roman history era from, uh, from my naming perspective. And so when I name my projects, they're typically Latin. So this particular project was Pertinax, which besides being an emperor, was, uh, is also Latin for persistent or stubborn. <laughs> And so you find under my GitHub repo, it's named Pertinax. Sorry for the odd sounding name. So that is the name, and this is a reference architecture. This is simply just the architecture of, hey, this is something I'm going to go back to. I'm writing the documentation and the wiki information around. As you can see here in the center, we have a collector server. It can be a Windows box, a server, Windows 10, whatever it may be. You want to have the OSEC client installed on it, uh, connected to your security onion sensor. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use, potentially, you could use PSExec and you could run um, all the runs using PSExec against the different clients in your environment. Uh, obligatory uh, side note here, if you're using PSExec, obviously be careful about credential reuse, spreading credentials across your environment. This is just reference architecture. If you're using it, be careful how you use it. Okay, just a side note there. Let's go a little bit deeper into this. To generate the logs, grab uh, uh, auto runs from live.sysinternals.com, and we have three requirements. First is we need to do a dash CT. This gives us a tab delimited CSV option. There's also an XML option, but we're using the CSV option throughout this. Secondly, is we want to verify signatures, do a dash S. Again, that allows us to filter out um, that Microsoft signed data and focus on the other data to us. And then finally, is that log file that we generated, it needs to be named with the source system that it came from. So if you're running this against dd-hr, the CSV file needs to be named dd-hr. We're gonna use that in normalization to give us more context around the logs. Once we've generated, now we need to collect this data. We need to grab this data, put it on the collector, for normalization and parsing over the security onion. So this is just a simple script. Um, you could just say for every host or IP address in this text file, run psexec and then run auto runs, redirect output to the local collector box into a folder. So at the end of the day, we'll have a folder of uh, 50 CSV files, let's say. And those 50, again, all correspond to the source, of, uh, all correspond to a unique host. Again, piece exec, uh, in the primary env environment that I'm involved in, we use Dell case. So we're doing all of this just from a Dell case. We're not using piece exec. Whatever you use to manage your endpoints, obviously use that if at all possible. So once we've generated the data, we've collected the data, now we need to normalize it. Unfortunately, the XML and the CSV output from on runs can be a little hard to um, just parse uh, without normalizing it. There's a PowerShell script I wrote that's available on GitHub that does this for you. What it does is remove the auto runs header rows. We add a unique identifier to each message that allows us to parse it more easily in the next step. We add the source host name and the runtime to each message so that when you pull up that message in ELSA, it gives you context. You can look at that one message and you can see runtime, where it came from, as well as a source host. We convert it to ASCII so that OSEC can import it. And finally, we replace the tab limiter with a pipe because syslog-ng does not parse tabs. So we need to replace that with a pipe. So once we've normalized all that data, now let's go ahead and import it and parse it. 
Um, again, what, what I've done in the environments that I work with is that the normalization script for every message, it drops it into a normalize.log file. Then we configure OSEC just simply right here. We configure it to look at the normalize.log file and every time a new message is added to that, it goes ahead and sends that over to Security Onion. From a ELSA pattern and OSEC decoder perspective, that is already integrated into Security Onion in the last month. You don't need to worry about any of that. That's all ready to go as long as you've normalized it in, uh, in the way that I've showed you, then the, the built-in parsers will work automatically. The data that you have available to you from a parsing perspective, you have the host name of the system it came from, you have the category. Remember in auto runs, you have lots of different categories of um, really persistence. And so you have the category type, you have the entry. So if this is a registry entry, it'd be the name of the entry or something of that nature. And then you have the profile. So if the host name is dd-r, it's going to be dd-r slash admin. Finally, the company, uh, which is Skype Technologies, and then the path to the image. Um, I'm not parsing out, the data is available, but we're not parsing out the signer, the version, the launch string, and a whole bunch of hashes. So all that data is available, we're just not parsing it out at this time. What's the, can I ask why? Yes, go ahead. Why? Because that was the limitation with else I can only parse out how many strings? Six strings, I think it is. So these were the ones that I picked based on the information. So profit, we're finally at the last step. We can actually view this data. So pop open ELSA, do class equal auto run, group by category, and you see all the different types of data that you now have available to you in ELSA. All right, so again, my point in this first section is go back to your network next week if this is something that's interesting to you. It's actually a fairly simple process as long as you can get that data off of your host. We just normalize it and send it over to Security Onion. Again, all the scripts and everything is available on GitHub. Um, I'll have that link for you at the end here. Now, from a real world use, uh, in the primary environment that I monitor, we're doing this on a daily basis. So we're going out, we're running auto runs on a daily basis against different hosts. Now, if you think about this, uh, if we're doing on a very small network of 50 hosts and we have 200 entries per host, that's going to be 10,000 entries a day to review. And most of that data is going to be duplicates because you just don't have that many changes from an auto runs perspective every single day. And so after a day uh, in production, I said, the heck with this, let's do diff. And so I just wrote a PowerShell diff script that will go through before normalization. It will say, is there, so here's a new log file coming in. Is there a file named the same in an archive folder? If there is, let's diff it. If there's any additions, any additional auto runs data, send that on for normalization an archive log file that just came in. So instead of doing, we're not, uh, really we're just checking from a previous run if there's any data from a source system. That brought down the amount of uh, data that we need to review to really just a few hundred entries. So on a network, a small network of 50 hosts, it was something like 600 or 700 entries at that point that we needed to review a much smaller amount of data. Secondly, is that clients versus servers, you'll should be quite obvious that there should be more auto runs changes on a clients versus your servers. Clients are gonna have Chrome, you're gonna have Flash, Adobe, you're gonna have apps installing, lots of different changes from an auto runs perspective. Servers, you should not, your mail servers should not be having auto runs changes on a daily basis. If they do, be very interested in seeing what in the world is going on your mail server. Okay, so what I did is I used a unique identifier between the clients and the servers and dashboard of the two. And so now I have a very easily, I can glance and say, yeah, there really is nothing changed in the server group, but quite a bit has changed in the clients. Let's look at that based on that perspective. You'll see some of that in just a minute. Third is that um, from an ELSA query perspective, in the last month, you'll notice on the sidebar of ELSA, under host data, there's a new section called, called auto runs. We have suggested queries for drivers, <coughs> hijacks, tasks, and logons. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at a number of different categories from auto runs and look at um, what that looks like in production and what are some different ways we can slice and dice this data. Uh, side note here, I use a bit of stacking, um, data stacking, least frequency analysis. The idea that if I have 50 hosts 
from the same image, and I get 15 unique services from those 50 hosts. By and large, of those 15 services, they should, most of them should be found on all 15, or excuse me, all 50 hosts. Whatever the outliers are, let's focus on those first. Those are the ones that are probably gonna be more suspicious. Let's look at that first. And so we'll, you'll see that scattered throughout um, the next few minutes. So the first section, or excuse me, the first category is drivers. And this is simply, when Auto Runs is run against the system, it's gonna list all non-disabled drivers at the time of log generation. And over here, the screen caps, I'm not sure you can see really far in the back, but at the top here, some suggested queries. We're doing category drivers, group by path, or filter out anything under system 32, anything under syswild 64. So this gives us all the non-disabled drivers on the system outside of the normal system folders. Um, see what's there, actually there is nothing illegitimate here, sysmon is normal for that environment, a bunch of Fortinet um, drivers, nothing abnormal there, it's just an idea of, okay, let's look for stuff outside of that. Flip that around and filter for anything inside of system 32, syswild 64, and filter out anything that's signed by Microsoft. And that gives you a bunch of data that you could look at as well that would be interesting to look at. Secondly is same data, but let's look at it a different way. Let's do a group by company. Let's stack it, so we'll look at the, at the very bottom here. And let's look for drivers that are not signed or not verified. And you'll see at the very bottom here, there's a couple that we'd want to check into. So not verified wave systems, not verified Intel Corporation. <laughs> things to look at, why are they not signed, what systems are they on. Also, generally speaking, you should be looking at some of these names. TunnelBear, TunnelBear is a VPN provider, so why is TunnelBear on one of our client systems? Is that legit or not? Let's go find out. Obviously, you can click into that. Um, I don't have a slide, I should have, but once you click into that uh, on TunnelBear, you would see the full um, data entry from auto runs and you could get a bit more detail about what what's uh, involved on that one Second is the logon category. This is all the common startup startup areas that you think of This would include run run once key start menu ms config all that type data And so the queries that I would suggest is again group by path filter for anything that includes the users and uh, let's filter out Spotify and Google just to filter down that data to a more manageable level. And at this point, the reason why I want to filter out things like um, C program files, I do have something in there, it didn't get filtered out. What I want to be able to do though is there's going to be a lot of auto starting apps in C program file. Let's filter that out. Let's only look at stuff that's starting in a user's folder. You can see we have two pieces of malware here. Again, stacking, we see that under C users, uh, username, and it's sitting in their root folder. And those are two pieces of malware that we found through this. Third is Internet Explorer. So IE add-ons at the time of log generation. This is actually from the service group. Um, it looks pretty normal. We've got, well, normal, sort of. We've got a bunch of Java runtime environment add-ons, unfortunately, on the servers. We also have Adobe Acrobat 7. Then at the very, very bottom here, a pretty interesting one, free download manager. Okay, so someone Malicious, maybe, maybe not, maybe a misconfiguration. Why is someone running free download manager, installing IE add-ons on the server? Probably not something most people want in their environments is IT people doing that from our servers. So not necessarily malicious, but you'll definitely find some interesting stuff. Explorer, so this would include shell extensions and add-ons. From here, we're gonna do our group by path like normal and just look and see if we see anything abnormal. We're stacking at the very top. We have a number of classic Explorer shells. We have 7-zip, Dropbox. They have one down here with some question marks, kzip shell.dll. So questions I would be asking is, why do we have question marks? What happened there? Did something screwed up with normalization? What, what's going on there? Come to find out this was a Chinese game loader something that someone had installed. Um, it's installed a bunch of other stuff that I'm not showing here. Um, and so the question marks are from the mistranslation of the Chinese characters and all that stuff. So again, it would be not necessarily malicious, more just why is this installed in the, in the system. As we get to the end, a couple other slides, there are a couple other sections. We have tasks. This is all registered tasks on the system that you run auto runs against. Stacking at the very top here now, we have just a couple systems 
with Red Spear Pro, driver update.exe, and update3.exe. Definitely malicious. We're doing a group by path. We're filtering out anything under app data. You're going to see a lot of um, Chrome uh, service, or excuse me, tasks updating from app data. And you're going to see a lot of that type stuff coming out of app data. So I try to filter that out. And let's see what else we see. And that's where those, that malware came to, came to the front. Final one here is services. So this is all auto start services on the system at the time of log generation. And again, you can do all sorts of things like this. You can filter it. You can stack it. You can see what's running on all your clients, what's going on. But then you can start asking questions like, OK, let's do a group by path. And then let's say, is there any servers, services running on a server out of a temp directory? OK? And we did get one hit, so we have a service that's all starting on the server, ctemp, clt, inst, vprremote.exe. So again, we would want to run down what's going on, what's going on with this. My point in bringing this out is that it's not just, it doesn't have to be just a simple queries of group by path and stack and look at least frequency and that sort of stuff. You can ask a lot of questions of, hey, this may not be malicious, but this is definitely a misconfiguration. We don't want production services running out of a temp directory in one of our production servers. So definitely find things like that from this data. Start asking questions. Where would I be seeing other types of persistence? And start filtering your data. So there are lots of other categories that we did not cover. It includes network providers, boot execute, LSA providers, win logon, known DLLs, print monitors, WMI, lots of different types of data. As I mentioned earlier, my goal is to bring context to the environment. And so from a networking perspective, I have great context. From a host perspective, we're getting there. And I want to continue to generate more of this type data that I can then integrate into my processes. And all of this provides that context. Moving forward, I think some of the things that would be interesting that I do not have included at this point is virus total integration that may or may not work for your environment. I didn't want to set that up initially just because um, obviously, there, there are some concerns with just going ahead and autom automatically submitting everything to VirusTotal. And so let's maybe add that later down the road. Secondly would be OSEC rule sets. I did not do much with OSEC rule sets. But again, there's definitely some possibilities of every time you see a service from the servers group um, popping open uh, under a temp directory, you know, go ahead and drop an alert. Lots of different things that you could do with this data. So uh, at this point, again, catch me on Twitter, at Defensive Depth, and then here's the GitHub link, github.com slash Defensive Depth slash Pertinax is the link. Um, I don't know, do we have time for questions, or do we want to? Five minutes. Five minutes, great. Any questions, comments, or snide remarks? If you do a snide remark, um, please send food with it, OK? <laughs> I love it when there are no questions. That's great, because then you don't get to put me on the spot. So I have no problem with that. Yes? Are you actually looking at network connections B4, B6? Say that one more time. Change of address or B4, B6 addresses? So I'm not with the auto run state of, um, I'm not doing any of that at this point. Okay. There's none, none of that. Sorry, I should. Uh, the question was, are you looking at any network connections, V4, V6, anything of that nature. From an other one's perspective, not. Sysmon has a lot of pretty interesting data. You could get very overwhelmed very easily with some of that data, but that is included in Sysmon. Yes? Are you looking at grabbing hashes for drivers and other things like that and storing Yeah, so the question is, are you looking at grabbing hashes for drivers and things like that and storing that? I think that'd be a great next step is this data is already here. It's not parsed out, but let's grab those hashes. Again, either submit them to VirusTotal or do something internally, store them, use it against your own list that you have. That data is all there and available. We're just not parsing it out at this point, but it could be easily done. All right, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.